I'm Shalina Tobin, aka Posh Nosh Gal, and today I'm joined by the brilliant chef, Kurth Gums. From his origins in the Caribbean, he learned his art with some of the most talented chefs in the world. You may recognize him from his appearances on the Great British Menu this year, but his day job is head chef at the highly celebrated Orma restaurant in the heart of Mayfair in London. Hello, Kurth, how are you? Hi, hi, I'm, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing very, very well. And um, so Orma Mayfair, it's, it's back. How does it feel to be, to be back after such a long break? It actually feels good. You know, we're still, as ever, you know, trying to catch our stride and, and, and adjust to everything that's going along. But, you know, I can say from a chef's point of view, sometimes having um, more time to be at home with family and friends is great. And then having too much time given to you that you didn't really expect or wanted can be a bit of a, a negative. So, um, yeah, it's good to be back in the kitchen and, and, you know, getting a bit of that energy again going along and feeding off of guys and they're drilling in. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know it must have been a really stressful time when restaurants were, were told to close. Um, but did you end up enjoying some of your lockdown time with the family? Did you spend quality time with them? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, like I said, it's, it's a present all gift wrapped to being able to, you know, have a Saturday night at home with, with your kids and your family. So I, I enjoyed it a lot. We did a lot of baking, a lot of cooking and just, you know, playing around outside in the trampoline and teaching my youngest son how to ride a bicycle. So it was oh, really good, you know. And you've got four kids. Yes. That's yes, helpful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so do any of them cook? Yes. Um, my oldest one, um, he's 11. Mm -hmm. Really good. I think he's he's more pulled towards the pastry, I think, because like he would say, Daddy, Daddy, I want to make a cake. And I'll be like, okay, yeah, go for it. Um, I'll wake up, you know, 7.30 and I'll come to the kitchen and he's already done testing the cake. I don't have to do nothing. He Googles wow. his own recipes, probes his cake, tests it, take it out, you know, chucks on whatever, Harry Bowl, Skittles, and just melt it down, make his own garnish. But in essence, the cake is actually edible. It's really good, not too sweet. It's light and... Yeah, he's good. He can make pastas. He can fry a steak, make a pasta sauce. You know, he's, he's all right. Well, is the pressure on for him? I mean, you must feel it, especially after your appearance on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that was something like instilling that like memory and that, that experience for him as well. I think it would never go away. I mean, okay. taking him with me through that program, um, it, it was great. It was great. So I know definitely he's going to have something to look forward to. And, and you know, we are competitive even as chefs, but even me in terms of training and instilling certain, you know, principles with my own kids, um, he's definitely going to be looking to outdo me. And that's what, that's all I want as well, you know, to do your best. Yeah, ab absolutely. So we're going to talk about um, the Great British Menu a little bit later on. I um, just wanted to cover some of your beginnings first, actually. So you're originally from Anguilla in the Caribbean, um, yeah. where you had a little bit of a, a rough start. Tell, tell us a little bit about that time and, and how you actually got yourself into cooking? So, um, yeah, it's in the Caribbean. I mean, it's a small island on the map. Like I always say to everyone, it's just like a dot, a pencil dot on the map and you can just barely read the word Anguilla. But having been like 35 square miles, a uh, population of only about 16,000 people. And, you know, it's surrounded by beautiful resorts, you know, top beaches, um, great food, great people. But you know, it was a bit rough in terms of coming up um, and, and you're know, finding yourself in certain groups of, you know, so it can make it a little bit more, more difficult for you in terms of going to school and, and so forth. You know, you wasn't sure, of, um, you know, when your next meal is going to be uh, and, and, and so forth. So, you know, going to school, I was involved in a lot of different things that not always you're proud to, to be to be talking about. But nevertheless, this was my story. This was me growing up. And having that kind of troubles on top of troubles going to school, it was, you know, more and more of a pressure, a lot of a heavy load, which drawed me a little bit more of a delinquent, you can say, a little bit more negative. But on the top of that, you always had um, supporting teachers and so forth that will engage you to do other stuff, whether it was track and field, or was, you know, great in that, um, whether it was cooking. We all had, had a... Um, a choice to choose between three compulsory subjects when you're going to Fort and Fifth Farm, and that was auto mechanics, woodwork, and food nutrition. 
Um, so, you know, I used to just walk around doing my assessment, trying to figure out where, where do I want to be, where do I fit in, and looking through all the windows and, and, and walking around and so forth. And there was dominated by boys, the auto mechanics and woodworks class, you know, chiseling away, banging things away, looking under hoods and getting all oily, oily and dirty. And it didn't really appeal to me, you know. Um, I wasn't really one of those type of boys was talking about supercars or building this or building that. I was never the kind of creative guy with my hands of making stuff. But when I was walking over to the food nutrition class, you know, looking into the window, it was like, 16 girls, two boys, and I was like, whoop, that's the class for me. I'm going in there, you know? But um, that was one pulling fact. But at the end of it, I was thinking, you know, behind of it, cooking was something that resonated with me because my mom, is, you know, she's a very good chef on Ireland. Everyone knows my mom. And I was thinking it's going to be a plus because at least if I know every Thursday or Friday, whenever we're doing food nutrition class, whatever I cook, I'm going to be able to take home and eat. So I know that was a, a solid score. You're going to definitely be eating every Thursday. Um, and, you know, going into the class, you know, shortly after, you know, the, the teachers, one of the teachers that I very much well respect, um, Miss Foy, you know, she would always say, oh, you boys are really doing good against the girls and this and that. And before you know it, like all that encouragement and, and stuff, we end up opening, me and one of my best friends who was in that class as well, um, a pizzeria uh, on the island, you know, when we were finishing high school. And it was, it made sense to do that because his uncle had the lead in and still does have the lead in bakery in my, in, in my island. And we would have got all the equipment and so forth, you know, as a tag along to be able to make our pizza dough and, and, and do all a little trial. And so we like, like, you know, little kids just being ambitious and trying to do something out and stay from off, off the streets from getting in trouble. So we, open a pizzeria and it was called Lemme Knows Pizza. It was just a knockoff. It means let me know what you want. And, um, you know, it was good. (laughs) So we did that for like a year and a half or so before then I decided I want to list something else. And I went into a five-star hotel on the island and it's there when I started to learn about the expediting and, and, and how to carry a tray and, you know, walking down from, the main part of the kitchen down to the beach restaurant with trays. It's a different stability and balance. And, you know, being around the first time seeing actual chefs doing the TV tricks, flambeing, throwing wine, getting those lobsters and just, you know, all the fire and stuff. It was just amazing, captivating, pulling me in. Um, so it's there when I started to see a little bit more about the kitchen side of things. And as I say, you know, my mom was throughout always catering to birthdays, weddings, funerals, you name it, you know, you're calling her to, to cater and she's always tagged me along and dragged me with her. And, you know, those days used to be long and boring, but when it, when you are actually serving and eating the food, it was happy days because everybody was always so complimentary in, 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 in telling her how great the food was. And that's, you know, the sounds of appreciation is something that sticks with me and that, you know, you, you're being awarded or, you know, acknowledged. For, for, for bringing comfort and happiness to people regardless of the, the, um, the theme, whether it's a funeral or a birthday or whatever, you know, through food, you're bringing happiness. So I wanted to, to be a part of, of something like that. Um, but cooking was, I would say, not the first part of me in terms of deciding to be a chef. I was in heavily involved in athletics and um, I had a scholarship and you know, for different reasons, the scholarship had fell through, and not fell through, they postponed it for six six months. And at that age, I was like, you know, like, no, why? You know, why would, uh, I'm the second fastest in the school, I've, you know, represented the island here, there, and there. Um, and I couldn't understand it, and I was like, no, that doesn't make sense. So I kind of, like, started to look at what the next thing was, was going to be for me, because I was a bit disgruntled as well by them trying to, postpone my scholarship as a mechanism to discipline me for whatever they see fit. So, you know, moving on, long story short, you know, I talked to my dad and X, Y, and Z, and um, we arranged and hooked up very quickly, I must say, you know, in 2003, September, we talked about uh, culinary school, and by 2004 January I was on a plane over here getting frostbite so yeah. (laughs) And what was it that actually pulled you to London? Well, over anywhere else. I think it was a mixture of two things. One, because I remember in that food nutrition class, we did have scouts coming from Le Cordon Bleu, and they were telling us about the school. So 
in my mind, it was about the school either in California or the school in Tatola, which is also in the Caribbean. But when I talked to my father, when we did the, he did the research more or less, he chose the furthest one away. So I won't be able to just get a boat ride or two hour flight back home. So I can get away from the island, get away from the delinquency, you know, the juvenile behavior and all this type of stuff. So um, it was more like, I think him tricking me and saying, this is the best way. But at the end of the day, it was more advanced to, to come to, to London or if you was going to go to America. But on the American side, it's more accessible for me to be able to reach back home faster. Right. Um, and I think that was the idea behind it. Just get me far away and just let me submerge myself into a world that's been advanced and, 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 and let me sink or swim. And, and you absolutely did that. I mean, you've got great experience behind you. And, and you started, so you, as you mentioned, you went to Le Cordon Bleu. And that was 15 years ago now. How, how has that opened doors for you? I think, one, it's commendable. Le Cordon Bleu, the school is state of the art. It's a great institution. Um, you know, all, all the, the produce was fresh, it was luxury ingredients, there wasn't shine away. It is an expensive school, but they do have a lot of quality. Um, the demos, the practical rooms, the teachers that came in to teach you, you know, it, it was great. Um, I would say that at that time when I was going to school, even when I was, you know, graduating, finishing, when I was looking, looking for, you know, first level entrance into different kitchens, um, I was, I didn't have some of the, the connections that they have now because I, I, I'm in quite good communications with the school now. Um, and I would find as I, I go along, like my first day, I, I also remember when I went into the kitchen for this first day of trial and the guy sent me down to the fridge. Uh, I came in, you know, my jacket all looking decorated up, you know, I feel like I'm wearing a badge, you know, my chest is up. So I'm like, good, you know, but you know, what, what does a, you know, 18 year old, 19 year old kid knows about being in the real kitchen. So he sent me down to the fridge for some, I think it was chevel or something like that. And I went down, I couldn't tell which one was chevel from sage to parsley to coriander. They all look the same. So I just grabbed the whole bunch, wrap them up, bring them up. And he like looking at me. Cause I was walking around a little bit, you know, pushy or cocky. You can say with, with my jacket, I'm feeling good. I graduated. I got a grand diploma. And <laughs> You know, it meant nothing. I didn't get the job, by the way. I didn't get the job. Oh. They probably were pissing off, laughing at me. But at the end of the day, I realized as I go along in, 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 in the places I chose to work and in, in, in for different people, as I started to give myself a bit more um, credit and um, rise to the, the level of the ranks in terms of um, acknowledgement, then the diploma was more valued and respected in that line. Yes, you can say, oh, I have the, the diploma and you go in, but it, it, it gives you a wake up call, not because you, you went to Le Cordon Bleu, which is state or that, that means you're gonna just be, you're gonna jump the ladder. No, I started at the bottom and I worked really, really hard. And as you go up, then it starts to mirror the effect and saying, oh, Kurt Gums, also a grand diploma of Le Cordon Bleu, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, but before the grand diploma, it wasn't saying anything for the respected chefs who was doing this day out. They was like looking down at it. What I did have is, you know, thankful I had a, a good base of French cuisine because, you know, the, even the recipes, a lot of them was in French, the teachers was French. I did have a good background and, you know, French chefs for me at that, at that age and even now they're highly acclaimed and looked upon. And when you think about food or you think about um, superior cuisine, you were thinking about a French way. So I had a good basis from Le Cordon Bleu, but it was um, a kind of a, a rocky road, just going through and proving yourself and trying to bring more meaningful essence towards that diploma. Yeah, well, you know, hard work really pays off and, and it obviously showed because you work with some of the top names in the industry with Joel Rubichon, Tom Aikens, Jason Atherton, and now you're at Sean Rankin's restaurants as well. What are the lessons that you've learned from some of those people and and that actually the lessons that make you are the chef you are today okay um there's a lot of things i think at that time and going through those kitchens they work very different like from the tom aiken style to the jewel robichon style and you know obviously i was a part of that team for the first atelier that opened i think it was 2007 2008 in london and you know work there until they get the first star until they get the second star so that was about two two and a half years before i, I moved on and 
their approach to things was quite different to how the British was. But at the same point in time, everybody was really into the produce and the food. And when you were at, at, at Tom Aikens, there was, you know, that was the flagship restaurant. It was a militant machine. And his style of food was very, you know, captivating. His artistry was, you know, amazing on the plate. But it was a very different mindset that you need to be in in that kitchen at that time or to a com as opposed to another kitchen mm -hmm. and what i always learn and what i think about is don't be don't be shy to look over people's shoulders you know you don't wait for people to come and teach you or invite you to learn you know um if you're going to do a section and you do it you're doing it for the last six months then there's no reason why you can't do that with your eyes closed per se in three hours time and then open up on the next three hours for you to go somewhere else and you know knock on someone's shoulders hey do, let me do that for you or show me how that's done you yeah. know it's, it's all about learning in your spare time rather than waiting for people to invite you over um and not all kitchens are open or welcome into it but i always encourage my own personal chefs to hey man you know crack on with your veg prep come over here and you know get get onto a fish get onto a piece of meat you know and because you, you're never going to just say oh um a chef the party and I can prep meat, I can prep fish without being able to give the, given the chance to mess it up. And not saying that that's what you want to do, but it's something that has to become an extension of you. Like you're writing with a pencil or a pen, it's a stencil, like using your knife. So, you know, you are going to, you know, misjudge how you cut that portion or fillet that fish. And it's okay. It's okay. So, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of that to, to be more patient, to be more encouraging towards um, the people that are with me, because I know when I was trying to, you know, look over people's shoulders or go around and meet you at the roundabout, there wasn't all welcoming or inviting, you know, everybody was turning their shoulders, sharing, and, you know, doing stuff to like sabotage. So um, it's unfortunate, but yet these are, uh, this is how it was back then for my own personal experience. That means that it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think, what I've learned from these things that can be viewed as, as a slightly negative is all these things. I take it and, and turn it into positives in my, in my own kitchen right now. Like for instance, um, every Saturday night without fail, I always have, um, a, a group, a, a chef's meeting, you know, once we finish deep clean, we have a little bit of a meeting. And I think it's like a way of having a bit of chef's therapy because many times when you're a, you know commie or chef the party or demi whatever your position sometimes you have things to say you bottle it up and that can make you a little bit frantic it can make you a bit nervous it can make your your um job or tendency less because you might be irritated for something that is on a way to me or the others and they might just up and quit and leave and then tomorrow morning you come you're starting fresh you, you know um i give them a chance to speak all around in a circle and it's not about holding any power. It's not about solving any issues right there and then. But what it is for me is about allowing everyone to hear and be considerate of these situations, whether it's like, oh, uh, for this week, I, every morning, I was the only one putting away the vegetables. Or uh, for this week, it was only me doing this and cleaning down. It would be nice if that, that, oh, that one, you showed me this, thank you. It's whether the thanks, it's whether the little things that irritates you, we say it not one-to-one, -one, not just with me, but just openly and, and everybody hear it. And what I hope from that is, you know, I've been doing it from since I've been here for four years now. So what I hope for that is, is as we go along for the next working day and the next shift is that when that issue that was raised is about to reoccur, at least you might be a little bit more concerned. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. Or oh, that person doesn't particularly like this and that's all we want to do bring a bit more awareness a bit more consideration and to dilute some of these frustrations and hopefully we'll get a bit more longevity out of this out of the staff um working in a place that they are happy to work in so ideally ending up producing better food with happy chefs well, you sound like you're a really great mentor to them as well. And um, actually, I just remembered something that you once said that Chef Julian O'Neill, he was a great motivational influence on you. Um, so, so tell me about that. In which ways was he a great uh, influence on you? Uh, I think one, because <laughs> Julian was probably the first chef after the, those chefs that didn't accept me when I didn't know what the hubs was. <laughs> he accepted me um, in his kitchen and um, I, I stayed there. Um, that was at uh, Terence Conran's restaurant, the Cragolinos. That was like years and years ago. Mm. And um, so I, I stayed there and I, I really worked and I was always very energetic. And 
you know, he was very encouraging. I guess he saw some things in me. And about two and a half to three years later, um, he did suggest to me that, you know, I need to feed this energy that I have and I need to go and work somewhere more challenging for me. Because I was hot lard of fish, sauce, veg, you name it, I was there. And I became like, like a chef torn up at a, you know, within my first two and a half years, just cracking on, moving, moving, moving. And he's the one that recommended me to go to Tom Akins actually. And so when he told me to do that, then I took the advice, I went, I did my trial app and, you know, I got through successfully, et cetera. And that was really good. It was a very, very difficult um, period, but at the same point in time, it is uh, food that I like. It's things that, you know, comes to, helps to shape these things that I, you know, I, I embody now, but at the same point in time, I, I do understand that whatever experiences I take from there, um, every, every chef or everybody has a story to tell and this is, is things that just adds to it and nothing is forever. So I only can ever, you know, tip my hat to Tom Akins and to Julian O'Neill for, for, for these things and, and, and everyone that I've worked for really, but Julian, um, so after I finished with Tom Akins, I went to Robisham and after I finished with Robisham, I went back to Julian O'Neill um, because I was six years into just Michelin star environment and those are extremely long hours and I, though I was, you know, very, you know, um, pushing in terms of learning new techniques and to cook and manage a section and so forth, people, it was not, it was not me that, you know, sometimes the, the more mean, the better it is because you have a less tolerance um, working these, these long hours and having such a, a high expectation for the fine dining and the cuisine that you're doing. You know, we didn't have time to want to do something, mess it up and then show someone and do it again. No, I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. But then really and truly, it's not just about yourself. So when I went back to, to, to Julian and Neil at the Woosley, it was more not because of the food it was to learn how to manage not not people but myself you know at that time i was very very uh, temperamental um and so forth and you know it was a great great as i say he was a great figurehead and you know he's always seen something in me and, and, and pushed me to do other things so i learned um a bit more of the the managerial side, you can say, um, as I would say more the humane side of things and balancing that as being a chef. Before then, I started to get the, the craving again, like, I want to do better food, I want to do more food, I want to see, you know, new things and push the boundaries with, you know, techniques and, and so forth. So then, after again, about two and a half to three years, it always comes up that time, that hunger, that yearning again. And then I, I left and I, you know, I went back into Michelin and then here and then Singapore and you know, it's been all over after that. But yeah. So, so when you talk about, you know, when you go and I found that quite interesting when you learn about um, calming your temperament, would you say that that makes you a better chef? Does that make you a better learner when you when you're just karma within yourself? Yeah, I, w I would say so. I think, like, I'm not saying that, again, it's not for everybody how they are. I just, I'm just relating just to the things that I know within myself and being able to tell the truth about how I, you know, I, I saw things and how I act out upon things. Um, and I think it, it, it is a part of growing. It's a part of evolving. It's a part of, you know, getting up the ladder, dealing with certain di situations differently. At the same point in time, you don't think that the temperaments that you have, you know, they're not always to be used as negative influences. You know, sometimes the same temperament you have are productive in terms of it helps to you to push yourself further because you are, you know, discontent of what you can achieve. You know, you can do better. And your manager, your, your head chef, they expect better because you're trying to achieve a mission star. You're trying to, to do great food or, you know, you, you learn something for the last one year and then you do this and it doesn't really pan out. Why? You know, it's like you learn your ABCs and then one day you come in and I don't know my ABCs anymore. That's frustrating. Why? What's going on here? So it was more like that. You know, it was different types of, of, of anger, but it was trying to, to put myself on the trajectory track of where I, I wanted to go. And, you know, that, that's, that's where it comes from.
Right. And so just going back a little bit with uh, Jean Roubichon, did you actually get to meet him? Many times. I mean, he used to call me Piet, Piet of the Carib because around that time is when you had um, Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie that came out. He used to come in and he used to say that, you know, we couldn't have too much discussions because he was just strictly French. And I remember I was like a senior chef of the party on the meat section. And every time he would come in, like every three months or so, this was a new branch, obviously. So every time he comes in, everybody was just scattering over the place. There's just more French than normal. I'm just a little, you know, Caribbean, <laughs> English, patois speaking guy, not understanding anything. And right. they said, they were always like, if I'm cooking on, on the section now, um, and I'll have a commie doing uh, my, my, my mash or my whatever, when Joel Robichon comes, I become the commie, the sous chef comes onto the section and I start doing the mash, right? Right. So I, at one point in time, I think it was on his third or so um, visit or fourth visit, you know, um, they decided to let me stay up because he was only always in French. And they said to me, in order for me to do that, to stay up and, and show the service while Mr. Robichon, because he was very, very respected. Everybody was just on their P's and Q's when he was in, nothing like a place. And it's quite a you know, consistent brand. So they said to me, I need to learn more um, of my dishes in French because everything was calling out in French. Didn't know it, even though I went to the French speaking school, etc. So I went home, I started my whole menu and the next month's menu just in terms of the, 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 the names of the in ingredients so I can understand what's away, you know, and what is the, the word for, for away, um, what is the tables. And very importantly, they told me, learn all your numbers in French because they used to have this massive piece of entrecote that used to go out to the to the guest table and they will just mark on the beef and it will come back and then I'll have to cut the same portion with it and then I'll have to be able to tell them in French, you know, it's, you know, du song, whatever, whatever, quatre francs, six, et cetera, et cetera. So they can say and charge the amount of money for this beef. So if I didn't learn these numbers very quickly, I would have lost the opportunity to be able to cook services while Joel Robichon uh, was on the pass. So I, I had a couple of services with him there and it was great, you know, and I feel, I, I felt um, a great, you know, reward of being able to, to achieve that, even though it was just speaking numbers. I still can't speak, but, <laughs> you know, he asked me a number, I knew, I, I know what to say to, to get me by. And that is just one of the, the challenges, you, you know, you have to do it in, in order to surpass certain things because as every minute it would be me at the back doing potatoes or I'll be downstairs doing more potatoes and as you know he's famous for the potatoes so um yeah you just wanted to 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 represent and know that they're they trust you enough whether you're French by blood or by speaking or not to be able to 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 be there and do it and that that shows as well if you're gonna train and you know focus on the craft and, and learn among them which is the best then you know you'll be given some kind of leeway right and and was is that true though so do people actually order the mash for dessert have you uh, ever the, heard that mash i'm telling you again like one of the, the the best things i used to eat from there and everybody used to eat it from there is just a plain piece of um sourdough bread on the tabernacle because you cook it on the tabernacle just toast it up and we just spread the mash onto bread like it <laughs> butter because it is so rich and creamy indulgent and i think if you eat too much you can you know what i mean but it was very tasty like it might sound like you like when people say oh you're eating um, bread with chips or you're eating bread with mashed potato well that's what we used to have you want a quick snack easy cunnel of mash on your bread swoop it down and we're chumming we're going down it was really good really good <laughs> and do you have uh, the similar mash in in your own kitchen when we do mash, I do follow that principle. I do follow that principle, it's yes. Like and 50% you know, butter and 50% potatoes, right? More or less. It's like, um, given the way that Teresa, it was like three kilos of mash to like two kilos of butter. So, yeah, it's quite a lot. Quite <laughs> yeah. a lot. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daunting job because, you know, I used to do a similar version as well at, at, at Tom Aikens. And then... That was, you know, one headache. And when I, from Tom Akins, when I went to Joel Robichon, and then they was doing it again, it was even more processing, you know, cook the potato, pass the potato, cook it down, spit it with milk, add your butter, pass it again, put it up. Oh my gosh, it was a lot 
a lot of potato. Just this. Oh, that's all you're doing. It's this <laughs> or this, you know? Yeah, you got Action. the muscles for it, so. <laughs> So how did the opportunity come about to work with Sean Rankin? Um, it was uh, one, of my, uh, one of my chefs who from with Julian and Neil, we worked together there for about two years, one of the guys there, and he left and he went and did some other stuff. And it was a time when I left um, the arts club and I was just moving on to like open for the next venture. And I was, you know, hanging around for about two months. I was working, but I was still not, like you know i was looking for my next thing and he, and he was aware of it as well and he was head chef within the company for one of the other restaurants that sean had and i think he told sean about about me and then they kind of called me over uh, i came maybe the next day after not the same day in the afternoon actually for, for a meeting then followed by the next day for another meeting and from there then it was onto a series of of cook-offs uh followed by uh, three months stint in, in Jersey and uh, in his restaurant there. Mm -hmm. And then it was back here to start to work on, on, on pre openings. So, yeah. Wow. And, and how much freedom do you have to be creative with a menu? Oh uh, yeah, I have quite a lot of freedom. And I mean, I've been doing the menus from, from day one, you can say from, from in the first, um, year there was, um, a few dishes that that Sean would have that was signature. There was about three or four dishes that was signature um, at, the, at the very beginning as well that was would sit alongside here. Mm -hmm. um, but all the other dishes in terms of, you know, changes, we used to do a lot of uh, du jour changes, special menu changes. It was always me. I used to always be, you know, doing a lot of um, draft tastings and, and, and so forth. So um, in terms of creative... Freedom, there's no um, big hold back there. I mean, there's always something somewhere, but in terms of creating the menu, I've, you know, I'm happy to say I've been going along steadily in, in trying to go within the flow and um, as well trying to sit alongside what our customers are in terms of our clientele and what and how they come in and what they expect to eat, what they like to eat. And sometimes that's about as well, just trying new stuff and being very creative. Right. And, and almost been open for, is it it's around four years now? Yeah. Yeah. So I was there last year, absolutely loved it. How much have your, has your style of cooking changed since you've, you've opened it? Um, yes, I, I would definitely say there is like changes. Um, and that, that is influenced by a few things. You know, I think a lot of chefs maybe it is influenced by the seasonality, mm -hmm. uh, what 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 um, produce is available. Um, it, it goes as well. I think it always worth, like I said, mentioning your staff in terms of how how strong they are. Because I don't believe sometimes as well, it doesn't make sense. I put dishes on the menu that only me can do or recreate. I, it has to be able to go straight through. I believe a lot in um, cross training. Um, you know, it's not just about um, pastry chef or kitchen chefs, you know, just, just chefs. I create all, all of the, the, the desserts, but equally so my pastry chefs can come in the kitchen and do the cold lauder or my garnish chefs can go in the pastry and, and, and do it. You know, we always have some skill tests. You always have to do Cornell's or chocolate writing or something. And my style has been involving with the people that's been getting more comfortable where they're able to be on more than one section. So I have a bit more diversity, so I can have a bit more um, pillars of strength. And, um, you know, as well, quite worth mentioning is the plates and so forth, whatever we are buying in, you know, you know I get some spanking ideas whenever time I see a really sexy plate or something like that, but it is all up to a, a lot of things. I think seasonality, the strength of those within uh, and around you and how you filter that around and, um, you know the aesthetic part of things and that is again it determines by you set out to say you want to do fine dining the people that come into the restaurant you know they expect fine dining so we try to always offer that top level of service not just through food but i mean in the front part as well with the restaurant the staff is very clued up and the restaurant managers you know she pushes on as well so yeah and have you ever been tempted to put any caribbean influences on the menu um Yes, I think um, I've done 
few little things like it it will all it's all about my different travels some stuff i like asian flavors it will come from southeast asia from my time in singapore or some things will come from the caribbean like i just came back i get fresh ideas and you bam you, you whack on all the coconut and malibu and, and pineapples into your desserts but not just as how you will expect them to be in lemon terms there's always some twists or creativity so we do put things within certain parts and categories of the menu where i can um yeah and it's something i look forward to even more as long as it's gonna like sit well like you know i, I just did this Johnny Cake, for instance, and you know, that is going to be great as a Lynn Bush, and we'll be offering that a little time soon, later in September, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so what type of um, experience are you looking to create with your menus from a, from a diner's perspective? I think as a diner, when you come in, you know, you even me when I go and eat, I like to be captivated by what's on, on on the plate first of all we all say you always eat with your eyes things are pretty but even more so it has to be really tasty and interesting it's for me i prefer to have tasting menu when i'm going out to eat than just the a la carte dishes because i like to see as much creativity throughout the whole menu and i take more inspiration that way and as well um not necessarily saying oh i have to like that flavor but I like the way that it's presented. I like the way that's plated. I like the way that's served. I like the plate it comes on. I like the flavors within it. So there's always something that I can take from many different dishes through tasting menus when I go out personally eating. So when my customers come in, I want them to be, to see the food as inviting, you know, see the food as uh, creative comfort, you know, not that they're going to shy away from it and figure out like, mm, what am I going to do here? No, it's okay. You know, if you want to, pick this up with your hand, go ahead. If you want to use your knife and fork, go ahead. You know, we are very relaxed in the sense of that type of etiquette. But obviously within fine dining, when you come in, you, you know how you would like to eat. And all for me, I want to make sure that I get across um, great flavors and compatibility with uh, um, a great presentation, you know. And, and you mentioned that, you know, you get a little bit of inspiration when you go to other restaurants as well. Where, where do you like to dine? I always put um, a list together like for every New Year's or within the first month of January of, of a few restaurants that I might come across uh, throughout the year. And I put them on like a little bu bucket list and I would try to, to go to one every two months or every three months or something like that. Um, and it, it's from fine dining to up and coming chefs to um, the new street food trend. And I'll just put them on in my notes and then I'll go and visit them, you know. So the, earlier this year for Tom Akins, he just had open Muse. I had that on my list. I went, uh, Jewel Robichon opened just opposite door to me here in Mayfair. Put that on my list. I went. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't do much more than that because I was in March. Um, the COVID came. So, yeah, but, yeah. you know. So last you, year you made it to tom aiken so that must have been really interesting because obviously you'd worked in that kitchen and you trained with tom aikens how did it feel to go back to his restaurant after all this time and dine at his new place muse um yeah it was good i think it, it, it when i saw it all the hype starting to come around and it was just around the corner it was like one of those things that i definitely just have to get on the list and yeah, we went there. The food was amazing. No, no doubt. We didn't fault that in any way. Um, Tom himself was there as well. We had a little chat, so that was super cool. And just the intimacy of just sitting right there next to the kitchen and, and watching him, as I've watched him so many times, do what he does, you know, um, run a tight ship. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a perfect view, right? So you're sitting in the restaurant. You, it's an open kitchen, so you can see everything going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it a lot good. of pressure. It's, it's intimate, it's, but it was beautiful. It's nicely done. Yeah. Yeah, we were, um, we were there just before COVID hit. Actually, I think we were probably the last sitting. And, um, and it was phenomenal. Absolutely loved, loved the dining experience there. So, yeah. so who else in the industry inspires you today? Who are the big chefs that you can, you can say, oh, this guy really, really inspires me? Um, Walk up. So far, I really, I really like, uh, I like to see a uh, restaurant, Franzen, Zen. I like to see their food. Um, I think that, I, th I think his brand of restaurants where he do, even from the head chef in Singapore to 
Sweden. I really like their style of food. Um, before I like um, the creativity of Alinea by Grant. Uh, shit. Uh, I like um, I like the innovation of Rene from Norma. Mm. Um, and I think these are just things on a curiosity level, you know, really to, to, to say you've done it as a chef and you, you, you feel that different inspiration that they're giving out through thousands and millions of, of, of followers that they have through social media and always pushing the boundaries of, of creativity and innovation. So you take little inspirations for different things, even as an as a, as a educational point of view. I'm in no way saying, oh, you know, I want to go there and see if it's really going to blow my mind. No, I want to go, uh, you know, I want to go there and exper experience whatever it is I can experience through what they are doing. Because, you know, I do think they are doing things that are groundbreaking, that are, you know, recognizable and, and so forth. So, yeah. And you're a chef as well that's constantly pushing yourself. Is this one of the things that led you to enter the Great British Menu? Yes, I think, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that was on my, my list to do. You know, I came in 2004. That started about 2006. From the same year it started to the next year, 2007, I was always watching that program for inspiration. I mean, they, they had loads of legendary chefs always turning out. And again, somebody here, there, and there, more than one was, you know, doing some stuff that was making you think like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, you can do that. That's new. That's not. So I always saw it and I wanted to be amongst the best of, in terms of being on a platform that, that was, you know, showcasing chefs of that caliber. And I've always said it. And 15 years later, I finally got an opportunity and, you know, I went there and what I wanted to do is definitely not, not go home in the new format on, on the second day because they were sending chefs home on the second day and then on the Thursday. And then I just wanted to be able to show my whole menu and really see if it is what I set out to do for all these years, that hunger that I had there, if I can actually push myself and, and be represented amongst them. And I was very happy with finally being able to be just there, you know. It was intimidating, it was exhilarating experience, but I was just happy to be there. Yeah, well, it was, you did phenomenally well. You made it to the finals. And, um, and that theme based on children's books, that was, that was an awesome theme, but how, how did you find it? Was it, did you find it very difficult? Initially, when I got a brief, I started thinking, oh, well, what am I going to do here? But as you go along, like, you know, settles in, like on the third day, I'm a, I'm a busy person in my mind when I'm starting to think about food. You know, I don't sleep that well. I'm just, it's just in there. I wake up, it's in there, it's coming out. It's always thinking, thinking, and then trying to fit dishes to the brief. And, you know, some of the, even I, you put my hats off to some of the people that was um, in the competition. I don't know how they got such, yeah, um, creativity and props made within the short time frame for to be you know enter your dishes within the first part of the brief i had to get these in and that in it was amazing because you're thinking about it when you say children's literature that's a part of you being becoming a child and me i'm having you know have four kids it's all about making you imaginary um you know showing you fantasy creativity it was no there was nothing to hold you back. So I thought the brief was, was brilliant. You can, there's such a, a wide scope of where you can go. And um, as much as I was starting to think like and get away with myself, I then had to reel it back in. I was like, but can I actually do that? Is that, you know, what, what am I gonna be able to do on camera? What is the kitchen, the setup, um, you know, and you gotta try to, you know, not, not just do things within your comfort zone. I definitely gotta go outside your comfort zone, but you gotta make things realistically practical and, and I was just you know um trying to make that balance because often or not as a chef we can get carried away and then it doesn't really work out and that brings me back to saying being able to progressively hit it consistently so yeah it was it was awesome it was really really great brief yeah and I I actually um I really like that your son helped you with some of the little figurines and and the clay heart that was yeah really, that was such a lovely touch <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good to try to, um, you know, get everybody involved, you know, yeah. for that clay hut in particularly, I, w I was, I was thinking of an idea, which I ordered like two or three sets of Jenga, right? You know, Jenga. So yeah. I had all these 
Jenga sets set up and I was thinking, oh, I, I can um, build the, the, the hut, the house out of Jenga and then ask one of the judges to move the Jenga and then it collapse over the, you know, the meat. And I would be like, oh, I blow your house down for my three little pigs. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> so yeah, you know, th these ideas were coming. And then when like, I ordered three Jenga, they came and I was like, oh no, I can't do that. Like, how am I going to transport it? How am I going to be able to build it to last? And if I construct it before, how am I going to then make it um, soft enough or, or vulnerable enough to be able to collapse again. So that was a, that didn't, that didn't go ahead. <laughs> and then I went along. The, sorry. That was a great idea though. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's just the practicality of it. And you know, my kids was always around. I was telling them this and that. And it was like, Oh, you are cool. This, that, and you know, you want to get him involved. It was him and his godmother as well. And we were all just, you know, making stuff up. And I was saying, this is the idea. How can we do that? And before you know it, each element um, of the dish on the starter had something, on my fish course had something from the kids, the, the main course, and just the dessert. I then said, okay, this is me to you guys. And I did all the building. So yeah. Yeah, I love the faraway tree. It's, and it looks absolutely stunning. Are we going to see any of these dishes at Orma? Well, that's actually in the plans. They are coming onto the menu. We just agreed now. It's going to come on. On the 17th of September, I will be doing my six course tasting menu for, from GBM here. So, yeah. Oh, exciting. That will be so, so cool. Thursdays to Saturdays from the 17th of September, all six um, dishes will be available as, re as, as it was on GBM. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. I, I am there. Absolutely. <laughs> I can't wait for that. that that's Great. Make sure you say hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What is next for you? Uh, what's next for me? I think, I don't know what's next for anyone really. I'm we're trying to right now, um, priorities trying to regain customers' confidence in, in what we do, not just in Oma Mayfair, but I think in hospitality on the whole, you know, there's so many restaurants that has been affected by what's going on through this COVID situation. And, we are trying to stabilize. We're trying to regain the customer's confidence, um, going into a festive period and, you know, welcoming old guests, new guests in, in support of, 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 of hospitality. And, you know, I would be very optimistic to say, where am I and what, what exactly I'm going to be doing next year when there's so much uncertainty still left. Uh, off the backhand of this post situation. I mean, the government just brought out the, the great scheme for August but what else is next to help to encourage people to go out? You know, it's only so much I can do, whether it's food and so forth, but you know, we need the customers to come out and dine and, and, and give us a try and, and, you know, have a conversation, you know, with us all and, and be able to make these things that so happy, uh, brought a lot of happiness to people before, you know, about nostalgia of just going out and dining and having a good old laugh over a great glass of wine and a affordable dinner. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that we are you know, always working on and we're trying to do that here. We are luckily enough to have a restaurant which kind of like can accommodate uh, good social distancing because we have a front part of the restaurant. We have then a back part of the restaurant. So, you know, we are doing our, our bits. We are tinkering um, the way we sell food and, 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 and so forth. And a lot of the dishes that I create, they normally um, always have on um, a tag on element to it, you know, where you can serve it before this dish or after that dish. Now we will just serve it together. So we limit the amount of times that we go to the table and, and so forth. But as of, as of now, you know, you can still say we had the training reels on because it's summer, a lot of everybody's on holiday, the kids, etc. But, you know, coming from like two weeks from now, there'll be some new dishes going on. And a week after that, then it would be the GBM menu on and, you know, we will be trying to be full out again, just doing what we got for this last part of the of the year because the first three quarters has been so terrible. Yeah, yeah, it has been it has been pretty difficult for everyone. And have you um, have you taken part in the Eat Out to Help Out scheme? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And in terms of um, in terms of your personal aspirations, so so you know, once things do get back to normal again, I mean, do you think that you know? you'll be working towards Michelin star level. I think okay. same like Great British Menu, I've always set it set out to say I would love to 
achieve a Michelin star. It's another thing that's on my list that will mean, you know, I can't even explain what it will mean. It's very, you know, something that I always look out to. It's that's why I work the way I work, the places I've worked and I would, you know, absolutely love to obtain my own Michelin star. You know, however, I do feel that the Michelin star is not, it's not, it's not just about me um, <clears throat> and so forth. And that's why I try to have this ethic with, with my team um, because I do feel, you know, regardless or not, you know, whether I'm here or if I'm not here or what's not, they're going to have that day. Whenever that Michelin inspector A is and whenever that inspe Michelin inspector comes in, we got to have staff that's happy and that's working to the, the optimum, the best that they can do. And I can be rest assured in my mind, regardless of whatever is going along, because everybody got stuff going along and issues. But when you do come into Omomere Face Kitchen to work, you are, you know, you're happy to partake. You're happy to do that food. And, you know, whether it's a, something of idea that you might give me or watch on, whatever the connection is, you're going to be connected with that food. So I know if I blink my eyes or I, I, I go out here to a customer to talk or come back in the kitchen or whatever it is, the food is going to continue to go. Because the Michelin star lies within, within the team. It's not just one person cooking for the Michelin inspector when we are supposed to be anonymous and I don't know. So I'm trying to get myself as my team along the same pattern and everybody here that's working a brilliant set of guys they are working towards that and you know we are from day one but you can't be just optimistic we, we haven't achieved it yet but it is definitely on the list um it probably would never go from my list um but at the same point in time if i don't achieve it Am I going to change anything? Yes, I'm going to change things. I'm going to continue to grow. I'm going to continue to change um, the, the dishes, the food, and, and hopefully I can do so within a balance that we are not overly busted on just focusing on that aspect where we forget about the normal, you know, the everyday diners who comes in who just wants to enjoy value for money. So I am still very much just, you know, um, focus on having that kind of, of service. And then if we are able to achieve the mission star alongside all these ethics and things that we are doing, it will be a brilliant plus and it will be probably my first A plus ever, in my, you know, so it'd be great. Well, I, I, I think you're close because um, when I came to the restaurant, I, I absolutely, I thought the food was phenomenal. I was blown away by it. So I don't think you're far off. And, Thank you. Um, and so, I mean, your, your kitchen, you, you talk about your team a lot. And, um, you know, I actually saw a really fun clip on, um, on the staff canteen of you doing your cleaning twerk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like such a fun environment as well. Yeah, yeah. But that was brilliant. I think everyone should go on to the staff canteen and watch me. <laughs> and watch, watch me cleaning some stoves, work. getting some boom shakalaka, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look like you like, you love doing it. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we're, we're almost done. I just have one last question for you. Tell me something about yourself that I couldn't possibly know. Sure. I don't know. I probably gave up all the secrets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it could be something personal. I, I, I am trying to think now. I get, you know, I told you I went to World Championships in Edmonton 2002. Um, well, to represent for track and field to represent the UK. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe if I if I wasn't a chef, I'd probably be on a uh, a strip pole dancing, doing the Google dancer. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm I'm, <laughs> a, I'm I'm an open book, so there's not much uh, much secrets to say. Um, but yeah, I think if you if anyone does have any questions or ever come to across anything, they can always send me a text or whatever and i'm more than happy to answer so that's very kind and um thank you so much for your time today it's been a pleasure chatting with you and guys if you want to get in touch with kurth and find out what he's up to he's at um kurth gums on instagram and i'm at posh nosh girl thanks kurth have a lovely day take thank care thank you bye, bye.